The Babylon Project was our last best hope for sci-fi. A self-contained podcast, one hour long, located on the internet. A place of fun and discussion for Babylon 5 fans everywhere. A shining beacon in cyberspace, all alone in the night. It was the dawn of the 20th anniversary of Babylon 5, the year the Great War to free Bab 5 came upon us all. This is the story of the last of the Babylon podcast. The year is 2016. The name of the place is the Babylon Project Podcast. Hey, this is Troy Rudder, former producer of Babylon5.com and keyword Babylon5 on America Online. And you are listening to the Babylon Project Podcast. Hi there, Babylon 5 fans. This is Raul, and I am here with my good friend Jim Arrowwood. How are you tonight, sir? Hello, doing well. Looking forward to checking out some feedback. Yes, this is not your normal uh, Babylon 5 uh, episode. This is going to be our second feedback episode. With the hiatus, we wanted to get rid of some of the uh, feedbacks that we had collected as we've been been going along. Um, Well, Jim, I think what we probably ought to do tonight is take most of the episodes in order, but... I, I do want to toss a little caveat there. In particular, I, I want to just do a quick shout out and thank you to people like uh, Jeff and Evelyn who've uh, posted a couple comments on the Facebook page, just saying a thank you for our return and glad that we're back. Oh yes, well, <laughs> <laughs> yes, welcome. Yeah, thanks. It's good to be back and. Uh... Looking forward to at least putting out an episode every two weeks at this point. At at, at this point, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, For for those who haven't been aware, it's not, first of all, it's not Jim's fault. Uh, The the delays have been largely mine. Uh, There's been, now, life. Life intervenes. Oh, I've had my share of life, too. And sometimes life sucks. (laughs) A variety of illnesses, uh, some family emergencies, just has really piled up. And even though Jim and I have been recording some episodes, as we've been able to, the problem has been being able to do the uh, final edit down and production. But we have gotten some wonderful help in Troy Rudder. Yes, and that's the same Troy Rudder who you heard at the beginning of the uh, opening credits. We've got some wonderful help from Troy Rudder in doing some of her post-production and editing. And just like Jim and I, he's another old school style person when it comes to audio. So it's a perfect fit. He's doing a great job. Yes. He's been, he's been a wonderful assistant. So definitely give the guy a shout out. Uh, He's easy to find on the web. I, I can't say enough good things about him at this point. Yeah, well, Troy is, uh, one of his things, his big things to do is he likes to collect autographs through the mail. So one place you could really check out Troy is his TTMFTW channel on YouTube. Uh, He regularly records and reports on uh, what he has sent out and what he has gotten back. And he puts up pictures and shows you. Also, he's also very, very much able to explain how to know whether something is done by a secretary or by a wife or by someone else or if the person has actually signed something. I'll tell you what, when it comes to autograph collecting, Troy knows his business. Now, did you say T-T-M-F-E-W? T-T-M-F-T-W. 
W. Through the mail for the win. And he posts regularly on Facebook, so if you um, if you followed him on Facebook, I'm sure that uh, you would get notifications when his new videos go up. And he posts lots of, uh, on Facebook at least, he posts lots of uh, Babylon 5 trivia, memorabilia, and just odds and ends that are a treasure trove. Yep. Kudos to Troy. Kudos to Troy. Now, our first feedback, and we've got several from him, is from Joe Hartwell, and he sent these as recordings. We're going to play them because they're, he, he's got some interesting thoughts, but he, he did apologize when he sent it in regarding the audio quality. That first feedback is on the episode Legacies. Hi guys, it's me, Joseph, again. I thought I'd give you another commentary or comment on uh, the episode Legacy. I always kind of liked this one because it did show how Sinclair did have respect for the Mimbari, even though a lot of the Ursus that didn't have respect for the Mimbari and, and they've honored dead. Also in this episode, you see how uh, Ivana does not like telepaths, but you see how she did help the girl who does have telepath capability with how her and Talia finally get to be not buddy-buddy, but they are friends. That's the best I can do for you this week. Talk to you later. All right. Yeah, uh, on Legacies, the, the whole bit about uh, Sinclair and his connection, respect, interaction with the Membari is, is going to be, especially in Season 3 when we get there, particularly important. Yeah, the Sinclair and the Membari... <laughs> seems to be made to go together. That's a good way of putting it, yes. Sinclair was there to be a diplomat, chiefly, and to hold the line, though, at the same time. Yep, and that is exactly what he did. It's a very different character with a very different purpose and role than uh, Sheridan that we have now in Season 2. Yes, it is, very much. All right, from the episode Eyes. From Joseph Fuller, we got also, I love the motorcycle subplot. That burger y'all talked about is nothing. You should check out Fuddruckers, the one-pound burger, as big as a small car tire, he laughs and says, and good. Mr. Gray was a good psychop, if there is one, uh, but I think he knew about the guy for eyes. In my mind, Garibaldi was a grunt who made friends and can fly star furies. I never could understand the mixing of ranks in B-5. And that was once again from Joseph. Yes. Um, yeah, we've got a Fud Records. We've had Fud Records here in St. Louis. The one that was close to my work, sadly, has closed. But he's right. It's a good burger. Uh, I've heard of it, but I've I've never been there. Now, I hear we have a comparison in Lincoln called King Kong Burger, which I okay. guess is pretty, pretty large also. Never, never heard of Never heard of those. Yeah. Uh, the best uh, burger, though, is still, it's a little pub, and if you ever get down to St. Louis, I promise I'll take you out here. It's called O'Connell's. You know, actually, Diane was talking about coming down to St. Louis at some point. Oh, you've got, uh, g- give me a buzz. I <laughs> will do. I'll make sure you're taken care of. <laughs> as far as Mr. Gray, knowing about the guy for eyes, mm-hmm. ooh, that's, you know, I, I, I can't necessarily discount that. There's things I, I've seen where you it's not so much you know it or don't know it. It's you don't want to face it. Mm. You, you don't want to admit to it. You follow what I mean? Yes. And, yeah, Garibaldi's background is a grunt, uh, certainly. Regarding the mixing of ranks in Babylon 5, Jim, yeah. I thought we addressed that eventually with A Voice in the Wilderness. When JP joins us. Yeah, I think so, too. So, Joseph, hopefully your questions there have been answered and addressed already. <laughs> and I also apologize to folks if you're hearing a dog uh, chattering in the background. That's coming from upstairs. Is a dog of small size and loud voice. Yes, it is Obi-Wan. It is Obi-Wan, and he loves Jim. <laughs> I, I should tell you, Jim. I, I'm surprised he hasn't been down here with his face in the camera <laughs> or on the screen. Because this morning, I told him he can say hi to Jim tonight. Oh. And his ears perked up, and he started dancing around. 
<laughs> so you, you, you're enough of a feature here at this household that our dog recognizes you by name. Well, there it is. <laughs> there it is. On to, on to eyes. We've got more feedback from eyes. Dallas writes to us, listening to you two talk about hamburgers really made me hungry. <laughs> I can't remember the name of the restaurant. But there is one in Vegas where the staff wear nursing and doctor outfits to make fun of the fact that the burgers are so high in calories, you might have a heart attack just eating one. No kidding. Well, oh. tell us tell us where it is. <laughs> one of these days, I'm also planning to go out and visit uh, our military consultant, J.P. Harvey, and uh, it would be kind of neat to uh, find that place. I think I have heard of this place before. And I can't think of the name of it. Yeah, the, the, they pr their point of pride is unhealthy. Bird. Occasionally, you see stories about them in the news. But if you remember, we used to live in Los Angeles, and we, we'd make uh, a little three-day trip to Las Vegas okay. somewhere around the 4th of July just to escape from everything for a few days. We never went there, but I've heard of it. <laughs> yeah, I guess our burger talk really got to people. And my tummy's rumbling. I haven't had dinner yet. Yeah, neither have I. I'm always up for a burger, though. Yep. Okay, our last email, you go ahead and take that. Yeah, we got we act, we got one, speaking of JP, we got one from him. Mm -hmm. And it is, it says, Raul and Jim, big thanks for the shout-out on this episode. I'm flattered to be part of the BPP crew. Some thoughts and comments are coming your way shortly via email. And he replies to Dallas, uh, The place you're thinking about in Las Vegas is the Heart Attack Grill. It's on Fremont Street, right at the end of what's called the Fremont Street Experience. It's still there and still serving amazing plates of unhealthy deliciousness. <laughs> <laughs> the staff are dressed just as you described. A great place to try once at your own risk. Okay. Okay, <laughs> thanks for, for thanks for filling in that little bit of uh, detail there, JP. <laughs> okay. Right. Now when I come out see you, JP, it's got to be that heart attack heart bleh. Yeah, if I can say it, heart attack grill. And I hope you've got your CPR certification up. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Although my my cholesterol numbers are pretty good. Mhm. Mm All right, moving on to a voice in the wilderness, parts 1. And, event, and parts two. From our webpage, we have a comment about the dancer Lando married. In season five, the very long night of Lando Malari, he mentioned that he had been pressured to divorce someone because of his status. I've always assumed that was her. Now, the dancer... No, he's not referring to the dancer that he, here in Babylon 5. We're not talking about Adira. No, we're not talking about Adira. Okay. But he references in that episode that when he was much younger, he had married a dancer and was forced to divorce her. Okay. I remember that now. Yeah. And I, I've, I haven't thought about that, but I suspect that this post is absolutely correct. Oh, most likely. If we're wrong or someone else knows, please let us know. Yep. Okay. Joe Hartwell also provides some feedback, and he takes on both Voice in the Wilderness 1 and 2. Hi guys, this is Joseph again. Uh, I'm kind of combining two uh, comments in one because it's a two-part system. The, the Wilderness episode about where they find out what planet that they're orbiting is a system of uh, ancient, uh, ancient, very ancient system of machines. Uh, I, I like the draw character. Definitely we'll see the draw character in, in later on. But it also shows how much of a delicate balance that the Earth Force has in truly what I call deep space. I like the fact that they did keep the secret of the human, that there is a living being in the center of the machine. I like the concept of the machine. I like the way they all kind of hide the truth to get to help each other in the end. And besides it, you know, I mean, it's one of the First, one of the first two episodes of season one that I really, really, really enjoyed. Really. So next time. Yeah. Voice in the Wilderness was one of the hook episodes for me, too, that helped me re really get deep into the show. Okay. And, and yes, 
uh, I like the way that that uh, Joseph mentioned that getting out into deep space, you find things that are bigger than you are, and they definitely find out that Epsilon Three has has a powerful being on board down there. Yeah, and I agree with him. I love 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 the Great Machine. Yes, I'm also a big Forbidden Planet fan. Yeah, I like that movie too. Uh, one other one other parallel I would draw there is from Star Trek, where uh, the episode where Q introduced Picard to the Borg for the first time. Okay, and said, "You guys are out here running around the galaxy, this part of the galaxy, like you, like 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 your big stuff." And he says, "There are things out there that will freeze your soul or chill your soul or something like that." Took him halfway across the galaxy and introduced them to the Borg, and uh, they found out in in a mighty big hurry that yeah, there are bigger fish out there. Mm-hmm. We're gonna find that out on Babylon Five too. Yep. Oh yeah. Well, and we'll just we'll see just how big the fish really are. Yes. I wonder if there's any fascisms there as far as minnows. It's too late for the minnows to vote. Hmm. <laughs> it's too late for the minnows to vote. The waterfall has already, I don't know. It, it, <laughs> I'd have to think about that one for a while. Yep. We actually have a few more from Joe, and the first one will be from Babylon Squared. Okay, the first one is from Babylon Squared. Hi, guys. It's me, Joseph. Uh, Babylon Squared, I like it, but it's extremely hard to explain this to my my daughter and my wife, but I like it because it does, it kind of explains what happened to Babylon 4, but not as much detail as it should, which is going to happen later on in the next few seasons. You do, you do have to pay attention to what you see, because you will see it again. So next time. The most important part there is right there at the end, you need to pay attention because you will see it again. Oh, yes. And, you know, and that's also the episode where we got Zathras. Yep, which explains why it was hard for him to explain to his wife and daughter. Well, yeah, Zathras does <laughs> <laughs> does baffle a person. Defy explanation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good heavens. All right, on to Quality of Mercy. Okay. Joseph, again, uh, the show, is, the episode is The Quality of Mercy. I like the episode. It truly is a standalone episode. I mean, you've got... Franklin trying to trying to right or wrong or what he thinks is wrong and turns out to be you know, he's wrong it's normal. Also, it was it has a different um, slant on it than the, just the typical oh we're gonna catch the guy the bad guy. I mean it gives you kind of gives you a picture of what they you know what they do in the future what they you know plan to do with mind wipes instead of just killing the guys you know capital punishment you know a mind wipe is terrible. But considering that, you know, you're still living. Plus, I just, like I said, overall, I just like the episode. And y'all did a great, you know, y'all are doing great commentary on it. So next time. Well, thank you. Jim? Uh, yes. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Uh, didn't he say a mind wipe is a terrible thing to waste? <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, gosh. One of, one of the things, but yeah, it was, a, it was seemingly a self-contained episode. At first, but then uh, later on, we find out that this piece of equipment is going to be used on a couple of our characters. Yes, yeah. it, it becomes important part of the storyline. Yeah, very shortly, in fact. Yes, in one case it'll be. We, we've already talked about it in uh, resurrecting or healing Garibaldi. Yes, and down the road, it it's also brought back out for a kind of a sad situation really Mm -hmm. indeed all right now his last feedback is on chrysalis hi guys me joseph again thought i'd send you a comment chrysalis is the episode uh this is the last of the season one this is where the you know what hits the fan and the fan is usually on high (laughs) uh garibaldi gets hit president gets hit and everything turns to crap so next time Huge turning point in Chrysalis. I think he pretty well sums that up nicely there. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, the fan is definitely on high. <laughs> so, yeah, and there's there's an awful lot of people in the way. 
Mm-hmm. Of course, uh, we know we know that President Clark is probably complicit in who's uh, manipulating the switch on that fan, also. Right. <laughs> that there is no doubt, and we well, there's some pretty good hints that uh, it's not just President Clark involved here. We we've seen some pretty solid hints towards uh, the Psychor being to its ears in that as well. Yes. So anyway, hey, Joe, thanks for all those voicemails. Keep keep sending them, please. Yeah, we know it takes a lot of work to do those. Okay, that covers the feedback we've got on specific episodes, Jim, but we also have a variety of general comments and some other emails that we probably want to get through as well. Okay, we can start out with uh, a comment from Charles Hildebrand from Facebook. Uh, one of those many moments in the show that seemed absolutely real. The Earth Alliance president's speech before the Battle of the Line was another. I'm not exactly sure what he would be referring to there. Oh, this is regarding one of the... And this is why this was included, Jim. This is okay. in regards to one of the clips that was posted on the webpage regarding uh -huh. ISN, our very favorite Maggie Egan, hey, hey. going back on the air in season four. That was a great moment. Right. When, when she is almost in tears explaining how they're back. Well, she is. She, she is in tears. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was, that was a very profound moment where you just, you, you saw Maggie back on the screen and you just kind of went, ah, it's all over. Yeah. But it isn't. <laughs> like I said, that's why I included this. It is just such an incredibly powerful piece of acting. And, and yeah. okay, in, in case you guys haven't figured out, we are Maggie Egan fans here, all right? But Oh, yeah. When, when someone can come in off and on over the course of the years and then deliver a performance like that, there's a reason we're Maggie Egan fans. <laughs> Okay, and uh, by the way, we also received some emails, and uh, this first one comes from the Andromeda podcast. That would be Ethan. It says, having just recently started into the Andromeda series and discussing the show episode by episode, I know how daunting the task can seem of taking on a complex sci-fi series in a podcast discussion. Just wanted to drop a line and say how much I appreciate your show and the care you take in fleshing out Straczynski's version. To date, I have not encountered another soul in my circle of friends or acquaintances that has an appreciation for B5. So it is nice to hear others discuss the show uh, that have an appreciation for it. Keep up the good work, guys. Looking forward to the journey. And that's from Ethan Maestri of the Age of Geek Pod, uh, or from Age of Geek Productions. Yeah, Ethan, thanks. That's all yes. I can... Yeah. And uh yeah, and also the Age of Geek podcast, uh one that is on my radar and I enjoy listening to that one. The guys the guys are really neat. Uh they do lots of different things and they come together once in a while and put together a show and it's always fun to listen to. So definitely give it a listen. Yes. Well, Ethan gets back to us. Uh, and, and gives me a little bit of a spanking. Correction, if I may. And this is from Ethan. In BPP-011 Believers, Raul makes the statement that Captain Rachel Garrett, played by Trisha O'Neill, is the only female captain portrayed on Star Trek The Next Generation. This is incorrect as actress Ursula Bryant played Captain Trilla Scott of the USS Renegade in the Season 1 episode, Conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Surely some other Star Trek fan has already pointed this out to you, but just in case, there you go. Still playing catch-up as I only recently discovered your fantastic podcast. Keep up the good work. And as I recall, I had forgotten Trila Scott. You did not spank me. Right. And she is one of the three people. Do you remember the Next Generation episode where the little bug things were taking people over? Oh gosh! It was it was a season one episode. Vaguely, J just just in my own defense, since you note, note this as both def my defense to you and Ethan, I more or less blew off season one of TNG. Okay, I, I really didn't become a regular 
consistent teen, next generation watcher until uh, Tasha Yar was killed. Okay. Well, and anyway, Trila Scott was one of two captains that uh, called Picard down to a planet to discuss a possible invasion scenario that was taking place or that they felt was taking place. And um, Captain, a friend of Picard's, his name his name was Walker Keel, was on another uh, Galaxy-class ship that was destroyed, basically. And Trila Scott did her best to help to, if I can use the term, assimilate Picard and Riker into this little collective that was going to take over. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't work out. They implied... There was an implication at the end of the episode that there might be another episode later on, but it never did seem to materialize. So, yes, Ethan, you are correct. Okay. As I've said many a times, this is why Jim is our resident Star Trek expert, <laughs> even though we are a Babylon 5 podcast. Yeah, well, there was a while there where I didn't have a life, and I just had to do nothing but watch Star Trek. <laughs> There's some people who accuse me of still being in that same state, by the way. <laughs> well, what what I actually used to do, I would watch a series of, of Star Trek, and then I would watch another series of something else that I had or buy something new. So I have several TV series, and when I started getting involved with the podcast thing, I, I stopped kind of re-watching everything over and over again. Right. I kind of miss it, actually. Oh, well, I'll get back to it one day. Okay, I'll probably have to read these final two emails uh, simply because they're... I, I'm not sure that uh, Gmail will allow us to have two people hooked in at the same time. Mm -hmm. And these are a little more recent. Uh, the first email is from John Reynolds, and it's just titled Some Feedback. John tells us, I am a huge Babylon 5 fan. And I am ecstatic to find your podcast. First of all, thank you very, very much. I just wish I had followed it from the start. Okay, I'm going to break into it again. You should be able to find all of the episodes from Season 1 on the webpage. I've got all 15 volumes of the B5 scripts by Joe, including the last one that includes the original five-year arc treatment and the joke scene where Jakar seduces Londo. I've also got a copy of the hardcover rules omnibus from the tabletop strategy game Babylon 5 Wars that is signed by JMS. The information in that game was canon, and the game makers were often used as a source for the graphic artists, etc. on the show. I wasn't aware of that. Wow, that, that would be neat. Yeah, I just listened to the Sci-Fi Diner episode you did the hijack on. Unfortunately, I haven't gotten far in the podcast series yet. I have to take issue with your opinion of Al Bester, and I'm pretty sure he's referring to me here. He wasn't the evil, power-hungry villain you made him out to be. In fact, I see him as a character very similar to Londo. They are each tragic characters not driven by personal power, but by a deep allegiance to their people. Everything each of these men did was because they truly felt it was the best for their people. Yes, Bester is cruel to mundanes, they don't matter to him, but he has a deep love for his telepaths. We'll come back to th this when we get some general discussion. Ah. I'm looking forward to your episode on Believers. That was the episode that really proved to me that BAP 5 was something special. On any other show, especially Trek, the parents would have seen the error of their ways when they saw their son was fine. But not here. On B5, they were more real to me. I am writing this while listening to your feedback episode. I jumped ahead to that. As big a fan of B5 as I am, I am not worried about the upcoming movie Joe wants to make. There are a few reasons for this. One, Joe is the one doing it. No one loves B5 more than he, and he won't screw it up. That's why there was only one volume of The Lost Tales. He didn't think he could do the story justice. Two, He's a smart enough writer to not just give us the same story with new actors. When he says reboot, I'm sure he means a whole new take on the story. If you doubt that, find and read his treatment of a Star Trek series reboot he submitted back in the early 2000s. I would love to know your thoughts on these, but no pressure or expectations, 
and I hope to give more feedback going forward. As Joe says, never surrender dreams. John Reynolds. Okay. Well, sounds like you got a neat, a lot of neat stuff. I definitely am looking forward to more feedback from him, too. Oh, yeah. All right. I am pretty sure I'm the main one he's referring to on Bester. Yeah. Bester has a definite agenda. He definitely has the definite agenda. Now, understand, I've read the Psychor trilogy, so I've got the background. We're not going to just get into it here on the clenched fist. If you've ever noticed, and this is something we talked about when we started the podcast, when he first showed up, I mentioned the his, watching his fist, the way his hands clench. When we get around to the books, we'll discuss that. But So, so I, I, I get exactly where he's coming from there. Mm-hmm. But you can't help but love to hate Bester. E- e- even even though I get where he's coming from. Yeah. Well, see, to me, Bester is, I wouldn't call him power hungry. Uh, he definitely can be evil. He's doing, he's doing a job that he was trained to do, that he enjoys doing. And I don't see him as, as being a power grabber as much as he likes to stay in the background and, but but he is controlling a pretty good uh, bunch of power as a background, yeah, in the yeah. background. So Now, John is absolutely right as far as what matters to him is the telepaths. Evil or villain, it depends on from whose side of the story you're telling it. And, and I'll just mention the uh, season five episode, The Core's Mother, The Core's Father. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, if you remember how that one ends... He, that's with that's when Bester chases down the uh, rogue with criminal with the uh, two apprentices. Yes, I remember the episode. Yeah, no, I'll do it from the girl and Bester's nods of approval there. Okay, mentions believers. He does mention believers. He has not listened to that yet, John. If you haven't listened to it by the time this rolls through, uh. Yeah, we definitely get philosophical. Now, I'm going to warn you in advance that I am not a huge fan of believers, but it's not because of the quality of the writing. It's because of what I do for a living and the way it reaches so close to home on me. So from that perspective, you know, and I believe I kind of make that clear in the podcast itself, it's like as far as what it does, yeah, it's excellent writing and a good story. Oh, well, uh, it's... It's by David Gerald. How how Love could what it, do you need to say? How how uh, it couldn't be anything but excellent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we do definitely get a little philosophical in that episode too, if I remember correctly, Jim. Yeah, I I think that that's actually for a show that we are not, well, at least you were not that fond of. It was full of a lot of stuff to talk about. Oh heavens, yes! Yeah, it's a very philosophical. Like I said, my my issue with the episode is how closely that relates to work, to what I do. You know, for the, for those who don't know, I am half cardiac research clinical scientist and half software engineer. Now, I, I'm not rolling up my sleeves and doing active clinical trials anymore, writing much software. It's more at the management, dealing with the regulatory side, uh, coaching, mentoring others, and along, and along those lines. But th- this episode, and you, you know, and I think I came to this conclusion back then, the fact that the episode hits too close to home for me actually says something about the quality of the episode. Yeah. Well, and that, and... It was it was a very important episode in the way of uh, demonstrating some of uh, Doctor Franklin's behaviors and quirks. Yes, yes, it's probably the best establishing episode for what we'll see in the future of Franklin. Yeah, he would at times, you know, he he will at times take on responsibility that he and authority that he is not had that he does not have, uh, depending on what he believes in or doesn't believe in. Mm-hmm. And it'll get him in trouble. Yep. Now, John wraps up talking about the proposed reboot that that has been uh, circulating around that Joe's talked about. And I can't disagree. I cannot disagree with him. It's not just that there was only the one volume of Lost Tales, but 
part of the reason Crusade ended mid-season of its first season was Joe was not willing to compromise story with uh, with management. Well, we all know that the business of television now is so different than what it was 21 years ago. Yep. I, I don't know if a show like Babylon 5 would make it today. There's very few times we disagree this is going to be one of them. I, I think that if it, were, if it was a show done to the level of quality that Straczynski did when he did Babylon 5, I have no doubt that it would, that it would succeed. I've talked to too many people who are screaming for something of that quality. Oh. And there's and, and, and there's two shows just off the top of my head that come up to mind that uh, demonstrate that. Uh, well, one of them is a science fiction show. One of them is not. Uh, the Daredevil series on Netflix. Absolutely brilliant writing, in my opinion. Well, yeah. And that's great if you have Netflix. Mm-hmm. All right. But, you Yeah, know, that's true. I don't intend to lay out extra money for other services that I don't already have. So yeah, uh, I I don't watch Daredevil, and you know uh, I happen to have Amazon Prime, so I I watched um, the Man in the High Castle, but I wouldn't have watched that if it was somewhere else. And now we've got something on. Uh, Hulu that I would have liked to have seen eleven twenty two sixty three. I'm not going to pay eight dollars yep. a month to to add more services. Now, in my case, what we've done, I, we cut the cable eleven years. Yeah, eleven years ago, mm-hmm. we've completely cut the cable. Yeah, Amazon Prime we get on an annual basis, and we do enough shopping with Amazon Prime anyway that it pays for itself just what we save on shipping yeah, absolutely and of course we've got hulu as we've, now we've dropped netflix whether we do or do not get it back remains to be seen but uh yeah but so so i can relate from there but the other show that i was going to mention you, you keep seeing shows that try to go the jms route and it's when they t- make the attempt that they that they are at their best and it's when they kind of compromise on that that they kind of stumble a bit. Mm-hmm. But I, I was going to, and you know me, I couldn't not mention Fringe. <laughs> yeah. They, they really made an effort to follow a, a consistent story, but in, in some ways it seemed like they kind of slipped out of that in, in the later seasons. Well, it it just seems like recently we are looking for shorter seasons, more story arc, strict story arc, week-to-week connected things, reality TV, so forth and so on. That's why I don't think someone would have that. It seems like to me that that folks don't have a lot of patience for a long year, something that stretches out into years like Babylon 5 did. But remember, part of the reason behind... Uh, uh, let me step back. What 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 you said was a critical piece there. You mentioned looking for story arc and serial. The problem with these shorter seasons isn't so much that people don't have the patience for a, a longer serial. It's that these shows aren't built with the kind of planning and structure that Straczynski did with Babylon Five. Oh, I know. They kind of they seem to. Um have their pulse on the public and they adapt the show to what opinion is a lot of times it seems. Mm-hmm. What Joe did that was the most unique in my opinion was the degree of planning of the series fr- from the outset. And if someone came in with a series with an idea that was that well planned out, mm-hmm. e- even with a longer 22 season, you know, season or even with a longer 22-episode season, I have no doubt that people wouldn't object to it, that they would be more than willing to buy into it Mm long-term. But the quality is what has to be there, and the organization and plan is what has to be there. I don't think the networks would go for it. Which is probably why it would have to come to one of the side services like Hulu or Netflix or Amazon. Yeah. But I, I have no doubt that it would succeed 
you you would have something that would sustain a little better than getting the nice high peak and then watching it drop down to a 1.2 1.1 at by the end of season one and just hover there in nowhere land yeah okay we do need to keep moving on yes we have another email from ethan correct of the uh, age of geek podcast and here's what ethan has to say i was really bummed when you guys disappeared for a time but as a podcaster i know life can often interfere with the hobby so i waited patiently for your return thank you yeah and and he called it he he actually talked on one of the uh, age of geek shows about this it's called pod fade and uh, <laughs> so yeah he feel he feels our pain at any yes. rate he says you certainly haven't disappointed as the series moves from season 1 into season 2 we really see the plot uh, coalesce and start to take on a dynamic that defines babylon 5 it is obvious that your conversations here have so much more to bite into and lends itself to some good podcast discussions. As for the episode, The Geometry of Shadows, I came to Babylon 5 because of the space sta space action, big fleet battles, and whatnot. Yes, I am a Deep Space Nine fan for that as well, as am I, okay. <laughs> uh, but I remember this episode being unique because it was one that made an impression on me without needing a big action and explosions to gain and keep my interest. JMS's ability to spin a yarn and the late Great and Sarah made this episode a fantastic one. Oh, heavens, yes. Yeah, can't disagree with that. I've really enjoyed listening to your discussions and viewpoints on the events and subjects in each episode, you both have a conversational quality about you that lends itself to keeping the listener engaged to the point that when you ask for listener feedback, we are ready to respond. I don't write into every very many podcasts I listen to, but yours is a podcast that demands I be engaged in, even to just drop a line once in a while. Keep at it. You are not alone in the voice in the wilderness. We are out here listening. And he says, P.S. One critique I would like to suggest is tweaking Jim's sound level during his summary. I have to turn that segment up if I happen to be listening in the car. Otherwise, everything sounds good. Okay. <laughs> I believe that should probably have already been done. Yeah, uh, Troy will be taking care of that. Partly Troy has been, and Jim, I know, has retweaked his uh, system at his end a bit. Yeah, I'm well, it's been uh for me setting up this I call it a studio, but it's actually just my basement. Um <laughs> uh, it's been a learning process. And so I'm slowly figuring things out and learning how to adjust levels and so forth and so on. And we're both analog junkies, so Yes. I'm going to have to do what I have uh jokingly called pull a Wayne Henderson, uh mostly because I he was we were chatting about when he stripped down and rewired his whole system. And I'm getting very close to a stage where I'm having to do that myself. In fact, my my mixers, I'm going to have to do some repatching. I've got an EQ coming in that'll be channeled into the compressor. I've got some cables that are starting to fail. They're old, quite <laughs> old. And I'm sure I've just made a few people's eyes glaze over. So Yeah, yeah. That's this is Raul. He's, and he'll he'll <laughs> he knows how to talk about sound systems. <laughs> That's what I do. Well, thank goodness, because if it weren't for you, I wouldn't have a, a clue what I'm doing with some of this stuff that I have. So oh. <laughs> you, you're assuming that I do have a clue. Well, apparently, I'm putting out some uh, audio here. So <laughs> yeah. Well, the main part. Going back to what, what he was saying on Geometry of Shadows, yeah, Michael and Sarah as Elric. That one guest cast role spawned an, an entire fandom, sub fandom in Babylon 5, where the techno mages are concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, wow. That, that, that has and always will be one of my favorite episodes. Well, and his voice was just absolutely, you know. I, I don't know if he was cast because of that voice, but... The, it's not just the voice, it's the control. Yeah. My God. He he just 
is in absolute control of every inflection that comes out. Mm -hmm. Well, he, you know, uh, with the years and years of experience he had, it, it, I mean, no matter what he's in, when he comes on the screen, he has such presence that, that a lot of other things fade into the background when he's there. Yeah, just 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 being there, he takes over the scene. Yeah. He doesn't have to do anything. There there aren't a large number of actors that can do that anymore. No, no, and, and it's sad that he's passed away. But boy, if if I can live as long as he did he, at ninety ninety one, and that was one of the things. So he he was call it twenty years ago. He was around seventy when he did that role. I think he sure didn't look it. No. No, that, that, that man has definitely had a blessed life. So, wow. Well, Jim, I think that covers all the feedback we've got so far. It certainly gets us up to date. It does. We'll have to do these more often. Yes, and, and, for, and for that, folks, that means we really need you to send us your email, uh, comment on the webpage, comment on Facebook, send us MP3s. Actually, send us any format, MP3, AUG, WAV. Well, don't, you don't want to send WAV. You'll eat up your bandwidth because those files are so darn big. But yes. you name the format, we, we can handle it. Yep. And I'll tell you what, it is. I want to make sure that I say thank you to Joseph, J Absolutely, JP, Joe. for writing in. Ethan, thank you. And wow, it's really neat to have you as a listener especially considering the quality of your podcast and and is and last but not least thank you john for writing in and i sure hope that you send uh send more our way mm -hmm. and everyone else as well and if you want to know where to find us be sure to listen to the wonderful and beautiful lady that well trust me she's beautiful yeah you're prejudiced well no i've i i i made that decision long before i married yeah. her <laughs> she is okay yeah, she is I'm an prejudiced. awesome awesome lady but she will tell you how to reach us and be able to send us your feedback as well yeah. so until then no boom today no no absolutely no boom today boom tomorrow most likely yep there's always always a boom tomorrow okay well good night folks good night everybody podcast terminated thank you for listening to the babylon project podcast you can email raul and jim at the babylon project podcast at gmail.com you can find us on facebook at the babylon project podcast on the internet we are at babylon project podcast dot wordpress dot com to subscribe to the podcast, you can find us on iTunes or you can subscribe to the RSS feed on the webpage.